Welcome back to the Anxiety Slayer Podcast. I'm Shan Vanderleek here with my wonderful friend and co-host, Ananga Sivir. Today we're talking about the different faces of anxiety that can shrink our lives. And often, these are things we don't realize come from anxiety. Hi, Ananga. It's good to be with you today. Hey, Shan. I thought we'd begin by discussing some of the things that make our lives small that we don't really associate with anxiety or feeling anxious. Yeah, the things that come up from the side or behind and we're just dealing with them and we don't really realize that they may be coming from anxiety and there may be something we can do about them. One of the things that used to come up for me a lot as a younger version of myself was feeling very transparent or incredibly vulnerable, thinking that everyone else in the world (laughs) could see in my head, or know what I was struggling with. And man, that was disarming. Mm. When we know the truth really is that everyone's looking in their own head. (laughs) Right? Sometimes even if we want somebody to see what we're trying to express or what we're dealing with, it's difficult because everyone's caught up in their own challenges and journey. But yeah, that can feel very vulnerable for sure. And uh, definitely something that comes hand in hand with with anxiety and definitely something that comes with that raised energy of anxiety that Ayurveda teaches about. If we notice we're feeling like that, it's a flag that it's something we can take care of and something we can look into. The other thing that still comes up for me, not as much as it used to, is being worried about every word choice I use when interacting with people. Mm. And because I have a really big mouth and lots of opinions and lots of fire, I share them, right? Mm -hmm. Often make people laugh, have good conversations, all feels well in the moment. And then when I'm by myself, I can go and pick, 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 pick. Why did I say that? Or, oh my goodness, that came off as arrogant or da, 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 da. Never realized that that could be anxiety. Yeah, and it's not vata anxiety. Again, talking about Ayurveda and the different mind types and how we're prone to anxiety. So vata is airy anxiety. So that would be my younger experience that goes with this, of the need to over-explain. Vata will push us to speak and explain, and I meant this, and I feel like that, or try and give a good account of ourselves so that we've not got that judgment coming in. But when we're picking over and analyzing, that's pitta anxiety. And it's typical pitta to do that. Pitta out of balance judges. If it's really out of balance, it will judge others quite unpleasantly. And (laughs) it will also judge us. We will judge ourselves and we will pick ourselves apart. Why did I do this? Why did I say that? It's still anxiety, it's for sure. But it's interesting to me to look at the different energies of anxiety and, and where they can come from. Oh, yeah. And when you bring up judgment, the other piece about perfection and being a perfectionist, I'm a recovering perfectionist. (laughs) I tried for years and years and years to be perfect, to avoid judgment. And the interesting thing about that is I may not have been judged as much from outside, but again, the, the inner judgment was still there, even if I was, air quotes, perfect. Right at work or in my relationships or, or what have you. So again, all of these things, and I'm so grateful for this, this meme that we found that had a number of these points that, that came up that said things I didn't know were anxiety. And it just cracked me up because these were some of the things that I didn't know were anxiety when we met many moons ago and started doing our podcast. We often don't. And it can make quite a fragmented experience of ourselves because we feel like, well, I struggle with this and I struggle with that. But when you look at them as aspects of the central issue of anxiety, it can be um, a little easier to work with. It can be easier to find some compassion. But also anything we do that calms general anxiety also informs these areas as well. Like somebody that's of a more 
a vata disposition, a more airy disposition towards anxiety, you know when that's coming up. If you learn to look at yourself, if you're experiencing disassociation, you feel disconnected from people around you, vata's coming up. If you feel the need to speak and explain yourself and you struggle to hear others because your mind's just racing to try and gain ground, that's vata coming up. So we know then there's things we can do to balance it. Okay, what do I do? This energy's coming up. And when the energies are out of balance, they provoke us. It urges us to speak. It urges us to do this. It jazzes our nervous system when we feel more anxious or there'll be a push to to feel more irritable, more self-critical, more intolerant of others than we know. Oh, that's Pitta coming up. What do I need to do to bring that in check? It's not a good experience for us, and it's not a good experience for those around us when these things are provoked. So it's good to know how they work. It's not difficult to learn a few clues of how they work, and it's very easy to apply some gentle opposites for balance. So it's definitely a worthwhile conversation. Well, that brings us nicely to what helps and what can we do when these feelings are coming up for us that we're just realizing maybe right now are associated with anxiety, that are associated with our primary dosha. Yeah, and it's finding a bit of space to reflect on it, first of all, is to get off the hamster wheel and get off autopilot and have some space to to look at that and see where we can find some, some ways to improve. Um, getting more grounded, working on building our personal peace and self-trust is a really important thing to work on with anxiety, trust in yourself. A balanced pitta will come away with a little humor from an event and they can say, okay, well, I did the best I can and I'm a human. Pitta's very funny when it's balanced and fluid and vata when it's grounded can be more give and take conversationally and more present. We need to be present. There's a remedy to the disassociation that Vata can experience in presence. So we need to see how can we invoke that? How can we bring that groundedness? It can be as simple as a walk, a walk in nature, a warm bath, some downtime, some still time. And then to give careful consideration when we're projecting our fears and our worries about ourselves onto others to give careful consideration to the thoughts and responses of others. Mm -hmm. Kind people, balanced people don't judge and they don't consider others stupid. So just to trust, to trust that and make room so that we can relax with the people we can trust. And if there are those in our lives that are overly judgmental or critical or we come away feeling out of balance or uncomfortable, then we've got the choice to look at distancing or boundaries, that we don't have to spend time in environments or with people that increase our anxiety. And it's also a good idea to consider realistic expectations, both from others and from ourselves, Supporting ourselves and knowing that we're giving our best and when it's time to rest and just being aware of what it is we need. And again, back to choice. I think our, our theme this whole year has been about the choices that we can make when we're struggling, the choices that we can make when we are at our best. And to know that you are absolutely perfect just the way you are. And having a better understanding of how you work and what brings you peace. And learning to trust yourself. That's, that's a big ask. I realize that that trust piece can be big for so many. I know it was big for me for a long time. Yeah, it's important work and it's ongoing work. But then there are places where we can get help and we can speak to professionals like the people at BetterHelp if we need to speak to somebody and go through something in detail with some support that facility is available to us. I think it's very valuable to do that and to be able to grant ourselves the space to look at where we're out of balance and where we need help. And we're all out of balance at different phases and stages of our life to different degrees. Um, that's one of the key teachings of Ayurveda is that we have to always be changing our sails according to what's going on around us, whether it's climate, environment, 
relationship, nutrition, we're adjusting all the time. And you can look at it as high maintenance, which doesn't feel very appealing, or you can just look at it as living a more fluid lifestyle where you're able to educate yourself about what serves you well and adjust yourselves to the wind. That feels better to me to look at it <laughs> that way. Mm -hmm. But it, it is constant adjustment, but it makes for a much better quality of life and a life that has room for the things that really matter to our heart, which anxiety can eclipse that heart space and those aspirations. So it's good work. It's also good to see where we can reclaim our space by setting healthy boundaries, which not everybody knows how to do. And how we respond to the expectations of others tells them how much they can push us, how much they can ask of us, how much they can get from us. And so being in a space of what works for me, getting to know yourself, what am I available for? What works for me? And so, for example, I have a very good friend. I love her, love her, love her. She was going through a very difficult time. And I was available to, to listen and to support her. And I'm always available to listen to support her in the, in the big picture. But this was getting to be a bit much for me to hold. And it was just a period of time. So it wasn't, it, it was a particular day where I wasn't available for it because I needed to care for myself. And as much as I don't like admitting that, and I think we all probably feel that way with somebody we love and care for, I had to let her know that I'm thinking of her, that I love her, and that I will be in touch with her tomorrow. Because I couldn't do it in that particular day. I couldn't be available 100% of the time while she was falling apart. Does that make sense? Yeah. And also, it's about understanding our capacity. And it, it's not a selfish thing to choose to show up when we show up at our best for others. Because sometimes if we overreach, we can show up in a way that isn't helpful to the person that needs support or us. Right. And I didn't want to come off as uncaring. I, you know, it was just, I, I was maxed out. I was tapped out. I had been traveling. I was tired and I didn't want her to feel alone. So I at least communicated something and then was able to have conversation with her the next day. And so I hope that our listeners can draw from that and, and know that it's okay that you're not available all the time for everyone else when you need to put yourself care first, when you need to, okay, I'm going to rest, I'm going to relax, I'm going to take care of myself, and then I can be available yeah. for my loved one. And um, we're available at our best. Mm -hmm. It's always better if we can show up rested and, and in good shape, and then we can really give support. Sometimes boundary setting doesn't come naturally to us. Personally, I had to learn it. It didn't come naturally to me at all. You've helped me a lot with boundary setting, and I've done a lot of reading on it, and it's something I've had to learn. I'm still learning, but I'm glad. I'm glad I've invested the time in looking at different ways to respond, because if I'm overtaxed in the past, I would still show up, but it would really deplete me for a long, long time. Yeah. And then I could become not resentful but just mentally overburdened that it would stick in my mind because I hadn't the resilience to show up. I'd do it, I'd show up and I'd try and be kind and I'd try and help but it would kind of drag my mind down further than I was comfortable with and take me a while to recover. That was such a beautiful way to describe it. Yes, that. <laughs> this leads us to some of the, the lifestyle changes that we can put into action as well when all of these little things that we didn't know were anxiety show up. Where do you go from there? Something I've learned is that part of not becoming overstrained or I would, I would say sometimes I felt squeezed like a lemon. It was like all my juice had been squeezed out and I had nothing left to give. So 
for me personally, something that really helped was getting up early and having my time first thing in the day. Because we're talking this month about, you know, anxiety not shrinking your life. So I find if I can get ahead of the day and I'm up early and I've read something inspiring, practice some meditation, whatever comes later in the day, I can cope better with. It's like I get a nonstick coating. And I can't tell you how many times I've written in my journal, thank God I got up early and meditated this morning because this came later in the day and I know I coped better because I was buffered. My nerves were buffered, my mind was nourished and I was grounded and I'd started my day how I needed. So I think it's very important to look at what gives us stability, what, mm -hmm. what gives us groundedness and what, what helps us build resilience. And it might be going for a walk on your own for 10 minutes. It might be doing some painting in the evening, listening to an audio book. Find what it is for you that gives you some self-quality time, some good time with yourself so you're in yourself and then whatever comes, you've just got that protection to deal with it. So that's my personal example. I love that example. And I have reclaimed my morning time as well. and. Whether I journal or whether I get my, all of my supplements and lemon water and all of my stuff lined up because I have a little protocol that I do each day for my sweet body. Mm -hmm. And then I've also added moving. So this morning before we started to record, I walked a couple of miles on the treadmill and listened to a wonderful podcast. Right, nice. And that was a gift to me. That was something like, oh, not only am I taking care of my body by walking, I get to listen to this very rich conversation that Tim Ferriss was having with Susan Cain. And for our listeners, I highly recommend that you check out Tim's podcast. He's pretty amazing, like right up there in the top podcasts of, of the world, speaking with an author that Ananga and I absolutely love. Susan Kane is the author of Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. And Ananga and I talked about that book uh, many years ago. Anyway, she's got a new book out and they're having this great conversation and it's just really powerful. But anyway, that was a gift that I gave myself. That's one of the things that I've decided to do is, is reclaim that time in the morning. Mm. And then get up, get my work done, and then go from there. And we need to give ourselves those gifts. Gifts are, an, are acts of self-love. They're acts of self-respect and self-healing. Really, really important. And it hasn't got to be a big deal, and it hasn't got to be ours. And Ayurveda teaches that we need stillness as an antidote to anxiety. The energy of anxiety um, in, that drives anxiety in Ayurveda is called chanchala. I love that word. <laughs> but it means like restless, restless and moving. So Ayurveda teaches that we apply the law of gentle opposites to find peace and to come back into balance. So we know that if our skin's dry, we need to apply oil. We need to moisturize. If, if things are rough and chapped and dry, we know the opposite to do for our body. But we also need to know for anxiety how to do that for our mind. So stillness is the opposite of, of chanchala. It's the opposite of restlessness. The challenge with anxiety is that it's very hard to be still when you're anxious. For one reason is that we're pushed by the energy in the body. And the other reason is that we tend to be avoidant of things that are uncomfortable and anxiety is very uncomfortable. And often when we sit still, it's right there downloading into our mind and that can be a very uncomfortable experience. So it's helpful to find supported stillness. Find peaceful immersion in something where we can be still and quiet, but our mind isn't going to turn in on us. So that could be a guided meditation where you're resting, but somebody else is shepherding you through. Uh, so for some people, it could be knitting or crochet. That's just a mindful, peaceful, one stitch at a time activity, baking, something creative. But we need to find what is it for me that brings me peace and stillness where my anxiety isn't going to come crashing in? Mm. And this time in the Northern Hemisphere, almost in Northern Michigan, I'll be in my garden soon. 
But uh, the weather just wants to keep teasing us and say, oh, how about a little bit more snow today? <laughs> <laughs> That's the best. I mean, you talk about getting grounded. <laughs> But getting my hands in the dirt, yeah, yeah. and and starting out the day, because I will shift to more time outside and more Mm -hmm. time grounding, like literally grounding, bare feet on the ground. Yeah, yeah, literally. And so easy. Mm -hmm. You know, when we get up in the morning and now it's starting to get a little lighter earlier in the mornings to just get outside, breathe the morning air, see who's singing in the bushes. (laughs) <laughs> see who's popping their heads up through the through the snow or the dirt and yeah just be in tune with the ground which it's very easy for us to lose that grounded connection when we're working indoors and we're working on computers and all these things that are very vata disturbing they bring up that anxious energy so yeah simple antidote mm. after the break we'll be talking about how to seek help for supporting the challenges that come up for us The Anxiety Slayer podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. People don't always realize that physical symptoms like headaches, teeth grinding, and even digestive issues can be indicators of stress. When I'm stressed, I get tension headaches and can be really hard on myself and others. Thankfully, I know how to alleviate stress on my own, but sometimes I need extra support. When my daughter went off to college at the beginning of the pandemic, I was super stressed, and I worked with a BetterHelp therapist and received wonderful support from a trained professional who was perfectly suited to help me navigate through my situation. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. And it's much more affordable than in-person therapy. Give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Anxiety Slayer listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com forward slash slayer. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com forward slash slayer. One of the things that you and I have talked about over the years is the importance of not being defined by the anxiety that we suffer. Let's dig a little bit deeper into that. So easy for the mind to default to fixating on the things we talked about earlier, feeling vulnerable, feeling everyone can see what we're struggling with, feeling judged, feeling we need to explain ourselves. The mind can really loop over those things and and really fixate on them. Um, Even just one small event, we can spend a week or two going over it, or it will be the persistent playlist in our head to bring those things up. And one thing that really helps is to not be defined by anxious thoughts, to understand that they're a part of us and they're a part of what we're dealing with, but they're not all of us. It's so easy to be defined by our struggles, but when we focus on our strengths or our talents or our aspirations, developing our natural abilities, we can push back against anxiety and regain some space. And the more we do that, the more space we regain. So then the anxious thoughts occupy a smaller part of our mind. So we're trying to reclaim territory Mm -hmm. in our head. It's, It's understood that with chronic pain, it can leach out into a much broader area of the brain and really take over. The, the way the brain operates, pain can be like an oil slick where it really spreads. But there are practices that can help you contain it and regain that space. And it's the same, same with anxiety. So when we focus on our strengths, what we love, things we want to do, and give those um, active attention and, and action, act on them, then we start to re- reclaim some space. And it also is an invitation to get to know yourself better because often when we're feeling anxious or we're struggling or we're in pain or whatever is is making us feel small it's as if these other things don't exist at all but they do and so if you can take a moment I invite you right now to grab a a pen and paper and write down a few of these questions. And if you need to pause to do that, go ahead and and pause. 
but this will be such a good exercise for you to do. And the first is, what are you naturally good at? What comes so easily for you? Something you don't even have to give much thought to. What are three things you love to do? What brings you peace of mind that you know as soon as you make that choice, you can drop your shoulders and exhale and feel peaceful? And finally, what consistently makes you smile? And whether you answer that right now, whether it was easy for you to just let that kind of roll onto the page or not, sit with it, answer these questions, and then keep that paper somewhere where you can refer to it daily. I have stickies all over the place that reminds <laughs> that remind me of the things that I love or little phrases or whatever. Me too. And it helps. Right now, the, the sticky note that I'm looking at is, my sweet body and being are open to receiving vibrant health, magic, and miracles. Tying into some of these questions. And so these are things that you can do. Go back and look at this and say, oh my gosh, you know what? I am naturally good at baking. I absolutely love watching the sunrise or set. Mm. Oh my goodness. Praying or meditating or sitting by the water brings me so much peace of mind. And my husband leaving for work each day, stopping in front of the kitchen window and waving and smiling at me for one last goodbye constantly makes me smile consistently makes me smile. How about you, Ananga, as, as you go through the list? What comes up for you? I love to write. I love to study. Writing's really good for my mind. Being with my family and friends, laughing with my family and friends. What brings me peace of mind is reading the Bhagavad Gita, reading scriptural texts from the Vedas, reading from the Vedas, lessons in life, learning about my mind, learning how to manage it, learning its strengths and pitfalls and how to look after it. And helping others with that brings me peace of mind. It's very affirming to me if I'm able to help somebody else as I go through my day. Uh, things that make me smile. Laughing with my daughter and her partner. We have really good laughs together. Even daft things like we have a little parrot that we live with who thinks he's big but he's tiny. <laughs> uh, he's been really funny. This week, uh, yesterday I put some music on and he really liked it and he was sitting on my hand whistling along and flicking his wings and shouting peekaboo and it just makes me laugh. <laughs> Seeing what brings a smile to our days. I love birds outside, robins, hearing them sing, seeing the little sparrows. We have some uh, wild parrots here flying over. I like looking out for them, looking at nature. Yeah, nature is something that is such a gift if we allow ourselves to take it in, in in so many ways. Something I trained myself to do or made a conscious effort to do when I was going through a really traumatic time not so long ago was if I noticed something made me smile, to sit with it for a moment and, and have that moment rather than just have it be fleeting and unconscious because we need that energy. Mm-hmm. Again, and I say this, I've probably said this in so many episodes, but the great and crushing beauty that is all around us, to be in it, immerse in it, sit with it, allow it in. Pause. Inhale, exhale, and then get on with your life. But to take it in, please. There's a reason why they say take time to smell the flowers. Yeah, and these are forms of nourishment. The mind is nourished by these things being brought to it, by what comes in through our senses. It's also disturbed by what comes in through our senses. So we need to antidote. We need to find mm -hmm. humor and beauty and sweet things and reflections and prayer and meditation and journaling and all the things that nourish the mind and steady the mind need to be in place. Just like with our nutrition, we have to be balanced in what we're what we're eating or it's going to cause our health to suffer. So 
often with anxiety, we feel like that's it. I've got anxiety and that's, that's how I am. But there's a lot more wiggle room with anxiety than we, than the mind likes us to think. There's a lot more we can do about it. A few nights ago, I was sharing with you before we started recording today, I had the opportunity to go to a beautiful concert. And it was in such a nice setting with beautiful plants and lighting and an excellent musician. And as I sat down, as my mind often still likes to do, I sat down, I felt happy, I felt grateful to be there. And then my mind started, what about this? And my stomach started to churn. And I was like, no, 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 no. Not now. We're not, we're not doing this now. And so I started to breathe, but it was persisting. And so then I just had a little word with my mind and it's like, you know what? You and I have been through a lot over recent years. Why don't we just have a nice evening together? We've got the opportunity to listen to some beautiful music, connect with some friends. You know, let's, let's just have a, a nice time. I knew if I pulled up too much energy against it, it would feed it. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't in a situation where I could jump up and start tapping. I can do the calm point and I can breathe, but I just felt like if I just had a little word, a little check in, in this moment, as far as I know, everything's okay. And the mind will challenge it and be like, well, what about what you don't know? It's like, you know what? Just, just leave it for now. And we can have those conversations with ourselves. And there is a part of us that's witnessing the mind, and that's our intelligence sits above our mind. And our intelligence can be a good mother to the mind and shepherd it and redirect it. And again, that's a practice and that's work. And there's days when it's easier and days when it's a struggle. But still, we have the opportunity to make that choice and to to see what works, to experiment a bit. It won't always be the same thing that works. But Ayurveda teaches that how we respond to our anxiety in this moment trains us and sets a course of action for our future responses. So if we flick on the TV or something or we start scrolling, we're more likely to go there in the, in the future. But if we stop and take a breath or practice some tapping or some journaling or clearing or have a little word with ourselves and see what we need and how we might settle, we're training ourselves to be more likely to do that in the future. And the more we do it, the better we get at it. And then it becomes a a readily available skill set. Checking in. How do I feel? What do I need? And to start also looking at where anxiety is shrinking your space and stealing your joy and choosing to make steps each day to express your natural abilities and actively invite what brings you peace into each day. So this is just little micro movements, practices, just being more mindful, paying more attention, referring to that paper that you just created and being really sweet with yourself to the best of your ability. If you want to receive more anxiety support, you're welcome to visit our Patreon where you can get a deeper dive into some of the topics we cover as well as over a hundred downloads including all of our guided relaxations, just for supporting our show. Learn more at patreon.com forward slash anxiety slayer.